Amen. Well, we're going to start here in the book of Matthew chapter number 17. So if you want to uh, turn there, Matthew chapter number 17, book of Matthew chapter number 17. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've already mentioned about my family and, and, and my kids and things like that. Um, you know, I praise God. You know, he's talking about, you know, in Kansas, uh, you can say amen. My family is all from Kentucky. And uh, so when my great grandpa died, they had six preachers. And we're not talking about six preachers that got up and said five minutes. We're talking about six full messages at his funeral. And, uh, and that was out in the side of the hill, buried in a pine box. And, uh, and uh, that's just how it was. You couldn't drive to the hill. You had to walk up these, you had to walk up down through the holler and up across the, every, I mean, just little paths. So uh, that's where my family's from. Now, I was born and raised in Indiana. So I'm a Hoosier born and Hoosier bred. And uh, so that's, you know, and I've lived in Indiana and, of course, pastored uh, two churches in Illinois and then now back in Indiana. Uh, but uh, it's a little bit different being around a whole bunch of pavement. You know, I got five acres out in the country. You know, we always had chickens and raised hogs and, you know, a big garden and things like that. So uh, when I knew God was going to be moving us, we, we sold all of our chickens and ate all the meat and <laughs> did all those kind of things. So I'm used to being able to just step out my, the back of my house and shoot my gun. And uh, so it's a little bit, uh, it'd be a little bit different, I'm sure, if the Lord would move us here. And, and uh, but, you know, praise the Lord. I, you could probably still shoot your gun, but you only shoot once, then they don't know where it comes from. You know, I learned that a long time ago. You know, you only shoot one time, then you, then you don't have to worry about it. But uh, anyway, Matthew chapter number 17, uh, I praise God for what he's done in, in uh, our lives. And uh, I think... Um, you know, if you have any questions, be thinking of those. I think we'll take some of those. And then if you need to talk afterwards and uh, uh, fill you in on anything that you need to know. Matthew chapter 17. Let's pray first. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. I know this church is praying and seeking your face concerning uh, the pastor that's going to be here. And I know that we are praying and seeking your will. And so, Father, we uh, thank you that we've been able to meet these folks, we thank you that we can see that there's another church in another state uh, serving you. So, Father, if it's your will to put us together, then we'll praise you. And if it's not your will, then we'll praise you for that as well. But we do thank you that we're able to uh, just get together and get to know each other today. And so, Father, we ask for wisdom that you'd lead God. Pray for the message tonight that you would speak to our hearts, that you would help us to grow in grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Now hold your place here in Matthew chapter number 17, book of Matthew 17. And let's look over in Mark chapter 9 real quick. Mark chapter number 9. We could read all three passages. This, this story that we're going to go over is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, we're not going to take uh, time to read all three passages of Scripture. But if, you know, when you read that in the book of, of Luke, well, let's read Mark first. Mark chapter 9, look in verse number 14. Mark chapter 9, verse 14 says, And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to him, saluted him. Now, the story here is the child that was a lunatic. And when you see the word lunatic in the Bible, it means just what it means. He, he was crazy. I mean, he had, he had a uh, devil inside of him, and uh, he would throw himself in the fire. He would try to throw himself in the water, and... I can't imagine what that would be like as a parent to constantly have to worry about your child, uh, you know, that, that that devil inside of him would, would tr was trying to destroy that child, you know, and, and worrying about that every time they go by water, every time they go by fire, what they went through, what that child was going through, what mama felt, what daddy felt, all the things that were going on there. And, and so the disciples came and they were going to try to cast that devil out and make everything better. And we know the story that they couldn't. Well, now that they couldn't do that, the scribes, these guys are coming up and questioning the disciples. You know, they're wanting to know what's going on. You know, and it's always funny. There's always somebody that's got to do that. But, you know, he said the scribes questioning with him. And straightway all the people, verse 15, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, Why, what question ye with them? 
And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which had a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he teareth him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answereth them and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. Now, I'm just going to mention this in verse number 18 because it doesn't mention this in the book of Matthew. But the Bible says that, he, that, the, that that dumb spirit would tear him and he was foaming and he was gnashing with his teeth and he was pining. So here, this, this little child, I mean, it was just, he was going crazy is what was happening. All right, so Jesus says, O faithless generation. It says, and they brought him unto him. And when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oftentimes it had cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said, unto, said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried, and rent him sore, and came out with him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Now, a couple things about this, and we're going to go in, in more detail when we go to the book of Matthew, but a couple things about this is the Bible describes this spirit as a dumb spirit, as a foul spirit. Uh, the Bible also mentions here about being uh, deaf and, and, and all those things and uh, dumb. Uh, but when you sit there and look at this, imagine if you would, when the Father comes to Jesus that he's coming with tears running down his face. Here was a problem in their family that was so big, and they couldn't do anything about it. Now, I suppose if we went around the room here, all of us could give examples, you know, of something that's happened in our life or in our family over ever how many years you've been alive, and you could point to something that seems like a great big huge mountain that you've had to deal with, and you're sitting there and you think, I can't do anything about this mountain. And that's the situation they were in. I, I, you know, I just I try to picture in my mind what it would be like on a daily basis to sit there and deal with what that child was going through. All of a sudden, he would just go in this fit and he would foam at the mouth and he would tear at himself and he would wallow on the ground. I mean, sometimes they'd be walking along and he would just, you know, just be like jumping right into the fire. I can't imagine the dad reaching and pulling him back out. You know, the, the times that the child would, would uh, the, the devil would drive him and get into the water. You know, how many times did, did they have to revive him? How many times did, was he sitting there coughing up water from jumping, in, from jumping in there? You know, think about for a minute what this boy would have looked like if this devil that was inside of him was having him go into the fire. He would have been all disfigured. I mean, you get burnt, there's scars that are left there. You know, the parents are sitting here. How, how do you go to sleep at night? How do you rest? How do you say, did, did they have to take turns guarding him? I mean, put yourself in their shoes for a minute and imagine what life would have been like for somebody in that position. I mean, if that doesn't give you a little bit of compassion for somebody or does, your heart doesn't go out for, to people like that, that, I mean, there's a problem with us if we don't, Feel bad for somebody like that. You know, we live in a day and age to where all around us there's people that are hurting. There's people that are struggling. There's people that, that need help. And if we're not careful, we can become cold and callous. And sometimes we can get to the place to where uh, we think, well, that's sowing and reaping. They deserve that. Well, they might deserve that. But the fact is, that's not for us to make that decision. That's not for us to sit there and pound the head of that person. The, you know, the Bible teaches just like Jesus. I mean, think about the emotions that he showed. I mean, the Bible says uh, about Lazarus that it says Jesus wept. I mean, here was a man that, that, that died and Jesus 
knew him and he was his friend and he loved him. And although even though he knew I can raise him from the dead, he still saw that situation and he wept. There was emotion there. How many times do we read about Jesus Christ and he looks at the crowd and he was moved with compassion. And yet we go through life and we walk by people every single day and we're uncaring about their soul, whether it's going to go to heaven or hell. We're uncaring about the struggles that they go through. We're uncaring about the things that they face in their lives. And if we're not careful, we get that coldness about us and God don't want us to have that coldness about us. Now that being said, there's things that you face, I'm sure. There's problems that I've faced in my life. There's, there's been situations in my life that I sit there and I think, how in the world are we ever going to make it through this? You know, there, there's been times in my life, you know, whether it's health or whether it's finances, you know what it's like. I don't need to give you illustrations from my life because we could all stand up and testify that we face things. And some things are hard and some things are, are difficult and, and it just feels like you're the only one going through it at that particular time. And, and you sit there and, I mean, how many times have you faced a financial or, or excuse me, a, a health situation in your life or in your family and somebody comes by and says, hey, how you doing? They don't really mean that because when you begin to describe how you're doing, oh, that's nice and down the road they go. And you're sitting there thinking they didn't even care. We've all been there. So what do you do during those times? How is it that you can get that mountain that it's in your life and moved over? Matthew chapter number 17 is where we began, and I guess I should have just went straight to Mark and then had you turn here, so I apologize for that. But Matthew chapter 17, verse number 14, the Bible says, And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, verse 15, Lord, have mercy on my son. He's saying, God, please, have mercy on my son. And he says, he is, the Bible says there, lunatic. And when you look that word up, it means exactly what you think it is. It means crazy. I mean, it, my son is acting like, a, like you know, uh, most of the time we read that wrong and we say he is a lunatic. But same, it's, it's the same difference. You know, when he says he is lunatic, he's crazy. You know, that's what he is. And, and I know we can make the jokes, and it's easy to have the jokes. Yeah, we all have lunatic sons and blah, blah, blah. We, you know, we, but, but foregoing the jokes tonight, think about this for a minute. This guy was lunatic. He was crazy. And the dad is sitting here at his wit's end saying, God, please, can you have mercy on my son? So we're sitting here, and, we sit, and he says, uh, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And when you read the book of Mark and when you read the book of Luke, it's not just that he accidentally trips into the fire. It's that the devil is throwing him into that fire. I mean, he's trying to destroy him, the Bible said in the book of Mark. The devil was intent upon taking that young boy and having him burned to death in the fire. That's exactly what the intent was of this devil. So he goes on and he says there, fire in the water. And he says, I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. You know, I came up to your disciples and I said, here's my son. Is there anything you could do? And the, and the disciples couldn't do anything for him. And that's why when Jesus walks up to the scene that's going on, he sees the disciples over here and they're being questioned by the scribes. I'd be curious to know what all questions that they were asking, but I'm sure that it was all nice and generous and they were being so kind to him. <laughs> right? Yeah, we all, know the diff we all know that, don't we, that that's not true. So then Jesus looks at him and says, Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Now, I don't know that I understand that there was a, another passage of Scripture that we could, we could look, and the Father uh, even says, Help thou mine unbelief. So I know that, that this is directed to everybody that's standing there because even the father didn't believe and he needed help believing. But that being said, I think that the most of this is being directed towards his disciples. You know, how long am I going to be with you? You know, I've been teaching you. I've been right here with you. And you still can't help this young man. You know, and so that's the situation we're in, verse 17, or 18. And Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. How exciting would that have been? Could you imagine being the mom and dad? 
And you are begging the Lord Jesus for mercy. And all of a sudden, the Lord Jesus Christ rebukes the devil. The devil is cast out of him. And now the child is well. And I can't imagine the tears of joy and the excitement because it was a deaf and dumb spirit. That means, they, that, that, means that he made it so that child couldn't hear. And it made it so that child couldn't speak. And now all of a sudden, this child is able to hear his parents' words. Now all of a sudden, this child is able to talk and communicate to the parents. Now all of a sudden, this child, I imagine, throws his arms around mom and dad. And mom and dad, could you imagine the tears and the joy and the happiness at that moment right there? There had been some excitement going on. And so that was the situation. So he was cured. And let me just say this in passing. You know, I think a lot of the things, you know, we hear some heinous crimes out there. You know, if somebody could just walk up to somebody and take a knife and cut their head off, are we really that? I mean, I mean there's got to be some demons going on around in that kind of stuff. I mean, there are unclean spirits in this day, just like there were unclean spirits back then. And, and these people, I mean, there's some heinous crimes that people do. And I'm not saying that every single heinous crime is because that person is possessed with some kind of a spirit. But I think that those things that, the, that people do, and, and you know, I, I remember in uh, high school going into a, uh, going into a, uh, uh, what do you call that place? Where you have men, the people that are, asylum. I can't remember exactly. Anyway, so I was going in there, and I mean, they literally had this man that wasn't any bigger than me that took his fist and he punched through a block wall. Now, that's not normal, folks. And they drug those people up and they just keep them sedated. That's all they can do with them. And you go in there and it just scares you half to death. And so we sit there and you look at those kind of things. That stuff is real today. And there are real problems and there are things that really happen to people in these situations. So verse number 19, then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? What is the reason, Lord, that we couldn't cast him out? I mean, they tried. I mean, that question right there lets you know that they had attempted it. You know, that they had tried to, and they couldn't. And so the Lord gives them an example here. Now, I know we can get hung up on the mountain part here. And, uh, and, and, and I hope you understand, you know, when we put this in the context. But he says in verse number 20, Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. So the Lord says, he says, listen. He says, the reason you could not cast him out is because of your unbelief. And he said, you know, if you had just the faith of a grain of mustard seed, he'd say, you'd be able to look at this mountain right here and command it to remove, and it'd move. Now, I don't know about you, but there's not... Uh, you know, is there any examples in the Bible of somebody moving on an entire mountain? So what do you think the Lord's really talking about when you put this into context? The mountain that he's talking about has to be dealing with this child. Now you say, well, I think literally that if I had enough faith, I'd remove a mountain. Well, then you'd get the glory and God's not interested in you getting the glory. The fact is this. Here was a young child that had a deaf and dumb spirit. He was called a foul spirit. He was called a devil. And here was this child that was a, uh, a lunatic. He was crazy. He kept trying to kill himself. All these things. The parents are in tears. They're coming to the disciples for help. The disciples could not do it. He says, then they go to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ cures that young child. The parents are excited. Now the disciples are sitting there thinking, how come I couldn't do that? And he says, it's your unbelief. And he says, because of your unbelief, he says, just like this mountain. If you had this mountain, you had enough faith, you'd be able to move that mountain. You know, if you had enough faith, you'd have been able to cast that devil out. Now, he looks at them and he finishes it off by saying in verse number 21, how be it this kind, this kind of faith, this kind cometh not out but by prayer and fasting. There are some situations that the only answer is going to be, you need to pray and fast. That's the answer. Now, I'm going to take a step back a little bit. Let's study prayer and fasting just real shortly, and then I want to come back to the story. Look over in Philippians chapter number 4 and verse number 6. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 6. 
There is no way that I can do justice to this topic of prayer in a few minutes. And there's no way that I can do justice to the topic of fasting in a few minutes. But we're just going to give you just a little taste, a little sliver, so that I give you just enough. And hopefully you can study on your own and we can go back to this story in Matthew 17. And hopefully you'll see the point I'm trying to make tonight. In Philippians chapter 4, verse number 6, this thing about prayer. He says in verse number 6, be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. He says, be careful for nothing. Now, I'm not for rewording the Bible, but so you understand what he's saying. He's saying this, don't worry. Stop worrying. We live in a, in, in, our, in a world that's just flying by our faces and all the problems that people face. And I'm going to tell you, anxiety creeps up. And all of a sudden, you get worried about every little thing. You know, they come out with some news thing that says, this food is going to be bad for you. And then two years later, they're like, whoops, sorry, that food is okay for you. An egg. You know, I'm not very good with these. I apologize, Brother Wes. <clears throat> everywhere I go, I've tried it on my tie. I've tried it here. I've tried it here. I've tried every which way. And my suit jackets. And I've noticed that you, you all are wanting a skinny preacher. So, uh, so, you know, I sat in that thing and I'm like, whoa. You know, so you can't gain weight and be a pastor around here. I'll guarantee you that if you want to sit on the platform anyway. And that's a good thing because, you know, we shouldn't get to, get too overweight anyway. But praise the Lord for that. So, uh, you know, we have all these things. You know, they come out, well, eggs are bad for you. And then, okay, eggs are good for you. And every, you know, but if you just get the old natural egg from you got about 10 hens and one rooster and you get that fertilized egg and you crack that man there's just nothing like that yolk's just nice and dark and yellow and num, 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 and i could have fried eggs every single day of my life and never get tired of it so we that's the kind of world we live in isn't it every you know this day's this this day's this then you read the newspaper and and rapes and murders and molestings and and and, and it's just ugh. then they get old after a while and then you're sitting here and, you, you know, if you got a 401k plan, you're sitting here, it's like, oh, good day today, bad day today, good day today, bad day today. I mean, it's just kind of, <sighs> I mean, you're just up and down all over the place. So when you look at this thing, listen, the Bible teaches in, in uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, be careful for nothing. Don't sit there and worry about all these things. Listen, will worrying change one thing? This brother here is here to see your brother that's in the hospital, correct? If I understand right, he needs to be saved? Okay. D d can I just say this? It doesn't, won't do any good to worry over him. Pray. Seek God's face. Trust God. But you will be sick to your stomach. How many things in our lives do we face? If I sat there and worried about every little... Man, I'd have stomach problems, break out in the hives, get all kinds of problems that happen in your life. Because we sit there and we worry. I mean, I mean, even uh, doctors will talk about stress and worry and anxiety, how that's one of the worst things for your body. And God knew that, otherwise he wouldn't put in here, be careful. Not. Do we trust God or not? Well, if we're going to trust God, then let's trust him. All right, so he says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. So every single thing, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to spend time supplicating, and I'm going to add with thanksgiving, because I'm telling you, God is already going to take care of that situation. Let your requests be made known unto God. And it's not by accident that the very next verse says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. So you spend time in prayer. Go over to 1 Timothy chapter number 2. In 1 Timothy chapter number 2, here's a passage of scripture that deals with prayer and things going along that line. So he says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 1, he says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession, uh, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. I don't know if you mark in your Bible or not. That's, you know, your own personal decision. I do mark in my Bible. I've had some people say that I shouldn't, but, you know, that's... You do what you're going to do, and I'm going to do what I'm going to do when it comes to marking my Bible. I circled in there that it's not just supplication, prayer, intercession, and thank. All those are plural. There's prayers, and there's supplications, and there's intercessions, and there's giving of thanks. If you think you're just going to go to God and say, rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, thanks for the grub, and that's it, 
then it's not going to work that way. There are times it's going to take uh, many times of praying, many times of seeking God's face, many times of going to God. There's times that, that you sit there and, and, and we want to pray where it's convenient for us. And you can't pray when it's just convenient for you. Have you ever been woke up in the middle of the night and you roll back over and go back to sleep? Did you ever think that maybe the Holy Spirit of God is prompting you to pray? for something? You ever have somebody that just comes into your mind and you think, why am I thinking about them right now? Do you ever think that it's the Lord wanting you to go uh, to him on their behalf? We need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God in these things and spend time in prayer and these intercessions going to, some, to, going to God on someone else's behalf and begging God for these things. We, that is the thing that we need to do with prayer. And then if you go back to Luke chapter number 18, and we don't have time to read the entire story, but let's just read verse number 1. But here's the story of the unjust judge. And this man sitting here, and there's a widow, and, and uh, you know, for a while... I mean, she just kept coming and coming and coming and coming and coming and coming and coming. Avenge me of my adversary. Avenge me of my adversary. Avenge me of my adversary. And you know, he didn't fear God, and he didn't care about the widow lady, but he got tired of being nagged to death. And so he took care of the problem. And I'm not saying that we should look at that as nagging God, but God is wanting us to go to him and not, be, not give up. He says in Luke 18, 1, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought... Oh, I think God made a mistake in my Bible because he said always. No, he said men ought always to pray. You think God made a mistake by putting that word in there? You think God made a mistake that he wants us to be in tune with him all the time? You think God made a mistake that, that he wants that line of communication open no matter when it is so that we can go to him at any moment? Listen. Uh, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Man, don't give up in your prayer life. All right, I could say a whole bunch more about prayer than that, and that's a whole series of lessons uh, just on prayer, but just to give you a little bit. Now, go back to uh, Matthew chapter number 6, and let's look at this thing of fasting. Now, this thing of fasting means exactly what you think it means. It means don't eat. <laughs> you know, you're not eating. And I know there's people, they come up with, well, let's do uh, this kind of fast, that kind of fast, the other kind of fast, whatever kind of fast. You know, God lays something on your heart. You do what God tells you to do. But for the most part, when he says fasting, he just means this, you're not eating. You go back to the Old Testament, you study it out, you're going to find that there are situations to where probably the most common uh, type of fasting is they would fast until even. In other words, they would go all day without eating, and then they would partake of supper. That was probably the most common. There were three-day fasts. You can find out there was times where they had seven days. Uh, Jesus Christ fasted 40 days, and that can be done. All right? So, so that, those aren't impossibilities. Now, uh, you, you sit there, and you know, some people say, I'm on a juice fast. Some people say, I'm on whatever kind. You know, you know they want to go to Daniel and say, I, you, got, you can eat this part. We can argue about all that stuff, not argue, but we can talk about all that stuff later. What I want to just say is, just simply put, a very simple, fasting you're doing without food. Okay, let's just make it simple right here. Obviously, we could teach a whole series of lessons on fasting. But here you are, and he's, he's talking about fasting in Matthew chapter number 6. Now, I don't personally think there's anything wrong with having a public fast. Because they did that in the Old Testament. You say, well, where is that in the New Testament? Acts chapter 13. They fasted and prayed when they were going and they were going to lay hands on Saul and uh, Barnabas to send them out. So the church fasted together. So there's nothing wrong with fasting as a group. But this particular instance, Jesus Christ is challenging what the people have learned from all these Pharisees. Because the fair, man, there are people, they go around, they disfigure themselves. I mean, they would, what's the matter, brother? Just fasting for God today. Well, they've already gotten their reward. All right, men have looked at them. That's what they've wanted. And since men have looked at them, they've received their reward. It's done. And I don't know about you, but I don't want a reward down here. I'd rather have God give me the reward in heaven. All right, so all that being said, Let's just narrow it down, this thing of fasting. Matthew chapter 6, look in verse 16. He says, moreover, when ye fast. So 
When he says, when ye fast, it is assumed that we will fast. Because he says, when ye fast. So if we don't fast, eh, there's something wrong. There, there needs to be times of fasting. Now, am I going to tell you there's a specific amount? No. But you know when God's dealing with you. You know when there's something you need to go to him about. And so fasting, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head, and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So there are times that we need to go to God in, in this attitude of prayer and fasting. And when we're fasting, listen, wash your face, get cleaned up, go about your daily business, and don't let anybody know what you're doing. All right? That's what we're supposed to do with fasting. Then if you look over in Luke chapter number 2 and verse number 37, Luke chapter 2 and verse 37, the Bible uh, teaches this. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 37. All right. We just celebrated Christmas. All right, not sure exactly how you all do Christmas. Some people don't do Christmas trees. Y'all do Christmas trees around here? Okay, do presents. Okay, I, I know some places don't. I'm not criticizing them. That's just, okay, I, I personally like to get presents. Okay, I like that, you know. Uh, this year wasn't as big of a deal, but I'm always the first one up on Christmas morning. The kids don't win. I want to open the presents, okay? So that's just the way it is. All right, so we just celebrated Christmas. We just celebrated the birth of our Savior, and here we are. Now, it's just a short time after the birth of the Savior, and, and Mary and Joseph have taken uh, the baby Jesus to the house of God and did all the law rituals that they're supposed to do. All right? There's a lady there by the name of Anna. Anna was a prophetess. More than likely, that means that she was, uh, her husband was a prophet. That's typically what that means when you hear, see the word like that. She, so she was the daughter of Phenuel, the tribe of Asher. Uh, the Bible says she was of great age, and she lived with an husband seven years. So imagine what it would be to get married. You're married seven years. Now she's been a widow all these years. Because now the Bible says that she's 84 years old. And that's pretty old, wouldn't you say? You know, you sit there and you look at that age, you know, 84 years old. She only was married seven years, and so she's just stayed a widow all those years. But look what she does in verse 37. It says, she was a widow of about four score and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with what? Fastings, plural, and prayers, plural, night and day. Here was a lady that spent her time serving God there at the temple, night and day, Fasting and praying, fasting and praying, fasting and praying. What an example of a lady. Now you sit there and you think about a lady. Like she had this thing down of fasting and praying. All right. So let's go back to our story of Matthew chapter 17. In Matthew chapter number 17, we look at the story and we see how there was a young man. And this young man had a, had a uh, devil inside of him. And we've already talked about all the things that's happened to him physically and how the parents were just seeking for some kind of help. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, because of your unbelief, that's why you couldn't cast him out, uh, their disciples. And he says, if you had the faith of a grain of mustard seed, then you'd be able to say to this mountain, remove hence. And it would go. So you need to have faith, you know, believe. But then he adds this thing at the end, howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. And let me just say this, there are situations in your life that are that mountain. There are situations, listen, can you move a mountain? I'm not talking about God through an earthquake, I'm just talking about, it. I mean, do mountains move? I mean, did, did you ever go out to, to uh, you know, the Rocky Mountains and, and then 10 years later go back and say, oh, they're not there. They're there. I'm not talking about when God, you know, the earthquakes and all that. And, you know, but, but the fact is, you know, you don't, you don't just have somebody come in and, and take a, 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 a scoop and, and there's the mountain move. They don't just jump up on their legs and run over here and sit down again. You know, you're not going to be able to go move that mountain. Well, 
that's the same situation with the problems you face in your life. Here was a situation, these parents, it was impossible for them to fix. Do you know how you fix that problem? Prayer and fasting. You say, now wait a minute, he said unbelief. Hold, hold with me for a minute. You fix it by prayer and fasting. You say, well, what if I have uh, some kind of, of, of addiction? You know, how, how do I deal with with this thing of this addiction. You know, there's people out there have addictions with alcohol, they have addictions with drugs, they have problems quitting smoking, they have, you know, uh, pornography, all the things that's out there, they, have, they struggle with those things. And you can go to all kinds of programs, can't you? How does God say to remove the mountain? Prayer and fasting. I don't care what your problem is in your life, prayer and fasting is the answer. When there's a relative that you really want to get saved, prayer and fasting. When, when there's a situation in your life that you're dealing with over here, prayer and fasting. God makes it very clear that this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. You know, you have problems. Uh, do husbands and wives ever have trouble with each other? No, that's what I thought. My wife and I are perfect and you wife and you're perfect you know the rest of you, you sorry <laughs> you know but husbands and wives you have problems you know instead of not communicating prayer and fasting you know you're sitting there and and uh, how many of us the, the children start getting to that age to where you're man oh lord i just really want my child to be saved at a young age and serve you all the days of his life prayer and fasting now here's Here's the problem. We don't really believe prayer and fasting is the answer. That's where the unbelief comes in. Well, there's, there's a different way. Well, see, you know, you know I, I have this, uh, you know, this, this friend that has this problem with alcohol, and so AA's got the answer. I have this friend that's got this problem over here, and, and, and they're dealing with this. And, and listen, you know, I, I'm not, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I don't want to criticize what they're doing. And, and these people know better than what I do. No, God knows best. And the best way to remove that mountain is by spending time in prayer and by fasting. Do you believe that? Do you believe it? Because the apostles didn't believe prayer and fasting was the answer. Because the Lord looked at them and said, the reason you couldn't cast him out is because of your unbelief. He said, if you had faith that uh, of a grain of mustard, you'd be able to move this mountain over here. You'd be able to handle this situation right here if you just had the faith. And the only way to get that right there is prayer and fasting. That's the answer. And, you, and we can walk out of here and we can go our way and we can say, well, prayer and fasting doesn't apply to my situation. Well, then your first problem is the unbelief. Because you don't believe that what God's answer is, is the answer that will help. See, God's answers don't always make sense. How do you get more? According to the Bible, it's to give. Well, I can't give because if I give, I'll have less. No, God says when you give, you get more. So are we going to believe God or are we going to believe how man says to do it? Because if God says to do it this way, it don't make sense to my flesh. If I'm going to save my life, then the answer is, according to the Word of God, is I have to lose it. That don't make sense to my flesh. In order to save my life, I have to lose my life. In order to get, I have to give. Those don't make sense whatsoever. Well, the problem is, it's not whether it makes sense to you. The problem is, do you really believe that what God said is the truth? That's the problem. So here's the situation. Disciples, you need to pray and fast. Do you believe that will help? That was what they faced. That's what they faced. Because he says here, because of your unbelief. Because if you have faith, and I know you can sit there and say, well, you know, uh, you know, I sit there and, and, and think about faith and all this, and, you know, faith, man, we got to have faith, and, and, all, ugh, and we can get all worked up over faith. Can you go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13? And the last verse, 
And tell me what the greatest of these is. It's charity, isn't it? Y'all know that verse? Why didn't he say faith was the greatest? We think faith is some mystical thing, this aura that's around us that helps us believe God. Let me tell you what faith is. Faith is just believing that what God said is really true. I mean, that's really all it boils down to. It, it's, not, it's not my flesh, it's not me. It's just, okay, God said this, I believe it. God said it. You ever hear the saying, God said it, I believe it, that settles it? That's not true. God said it, that settles it. Now, if you believe it, that's a plus. But whether you believe it or not, it's still true. So what you have to do is you have to take this book and you have to read it and whatever it says, just believe it and trust it that it's true. Did you do that for salvation? Why is it we can do that for salvation but we doubt when it comes to service? Something to think about tonight, isn't it? Spend some time praying. Spend some time fasting. Father,